punched. Um, but next up is Dr. Fraser Henderson. So, uh, Dr. Henderson, if you're ready. Sure, um, yeah. oh, okay. Perfect. Uh, okay, I'll try to be a little briefer. Uh, uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak. I'm going to present uh, the findings of our recent publication <clears throat> on atlantoaxial rotary uh, subluxation in the uh, hypermobile hereditary connective tissue disorder population. Next. Uh, I, uh, we self-funded this. There's no disclosure. Next. <clears throat> I think it's uh, well known in the rheumatoid arthritis population that uh, 50% of patients uh, were myelopathic from C12 instability, sorry, 20% were myelopathic from C12 instability. And in the old days, uh, about 10% of patients were thought to have died as a result of that. Um, and this was echoed uh, both in the paper by Joachim and also by Phalanx. Now, I have to say, since the development of Enbrel, uh, the morbidity of rheumatoid arthritis is uh, greatly decreased. Next. Uh, next. Uh, Joachim pointed out that 80% of patients with rheumatoid arthritis with atlantoaxial instability had anterior subluxation due to incompetence of the transverse odontoid ligament, and 20% had lateral subluxation due to incompetence of the alar ligament. Next. <coughs> It's uh, AAS is very common in, in uh, lupus, JRA, and many other disorders. Next. Uh, in the uh, HOX-D3 segmentation failure, uh, where the C1 remains uh, fused to the skull base, for instance, we see a higher number of uh, AAI. In Golden Horace syndrome, uh, approximately 15%. Uh, studies on ligament laxity in children show a high rate of uh, atlantoaxial subluxation. And there's a higher than expected incidence of atlantoaxial instability in the connective tissue disorders such as ehlers danlos syndrome, Stickler, Louis Dietz, Marfan, and Morquier syndromes. Next. <clears throat> so there are over 50 hereditary connective tissue disorders, and they're all characterized by joint hypermobility, loose ligaments, dysautonomia and many other comorbid conditions. And the spinal and neurological manifestations have only recently been uh, recognized and described next. Uh, Ed Benzel and P Paolo and Richard Ellenbogen and Don and Long and, other, and uh, Miles Scobie and Petra. And I recently published an article in the American Journal of Medical Genetics, actually this is 2017, in which we described uh, a certain proclivity in these disorders for atlantoaxial instability. Next. Uh, in uh, Halko's paper of, of vascular EDS, three of those patients had C12 instability. Next. So uh, we were seeing a number of patients with headache, syncope, and orthostatic symptoms, and dysautonomia. And we hypothesized that a C12 inst uh, stabilization and fusion would improve pain, performance status, and relieve the uh, syncope, presyncopal issues. Next. So we uh, set up an IRB-approved study, sent letters out to 23 consecutive patients who had undergone surgery. Uh, 20 responded, and they're the substance of this uh, report. They mailed, uh, in addition to the data we collected initially, uh, they uh, put my camera on. They uh, uh, send in uh, data to the uh, to a third party nurse. The radiological measurements were made by a neuroradiologist. Uh, we looked at Kanofsky short term short form health surveys, ability to return to work, patient satisfaction, neurologic exam, and so on. Next, uh, the inclusion criteria included a formal genetics evaluation and diagnosis, severe headaches or neck pain greater than se seven or above over ten. Uh, symptoms and findings congruent with atlantoaxial instability, in other words, <clears throat> primarily the cervical medullary syndrome-like symptoms, and radiological findings uh, supporting the diagnosis, and of course, failed non-operative treatment. They had to understand that surgery was the last option. Next. And this is one of the forms they filled out before and after surgery, 
and we assessed about 40 different symptoms. Next. Now, the diagnosis of a rotary atlantoaxial instability or a fielding type 1 is different than that for an anterior subluxation. Next. So, uh, on, on the left is the anterior subluxation, failed transverse odontoid ligament, abnormal atlantodental interval. On the right is a rotary subluxation, fielding type 1, and the atlantodental interval is normal, but the facets have subluxed more on one side than the other. Next. To diagnose this, you need to put the patient supine in the CT scanner and rotate the head full right and then next full left. And then look at the axial views and you'll see the angle from straight anterior of the C1 on the left is 85 degrees and the C2 is 40 degrees. <coughs> so the difference there is 45 degrees and that's uh, pathological. Next. Here's another way uh, you can do an open mouth uh, digital dynamic fluoroscopy and look at lateral translation of C1 upon C2. Normally, this is less than 1.6 millimeters. If it's more than 3.5, that would be, uh, that would indicate an incompetent ALAR ligament. Next. And this 3D reconstruction shows a 90% subluxation of the facet joint. That's another indication of a uh, sublux uh, of AAI. Next. So a surgical procedure <clears throat> next involved uh, you know uh, realignment with traction next. And then the standard uh, goals harms technique using uh, screw lateral mass screws at C1, <clears throat> pedicle screws at C2, and then a, a highly contoured uh, allograft between C1 and C2. Uh, we also injected uh, bone marrow into the allograft to give it uh, improved healing uh, characteristics. Next. <clears throat> for statistical analysis, we use paired t-test for the normally distributed data and Wilcoxon paired ranks test for the ordinal data or continuous variables. Next. Next. Uh, now, in this uh, group, we found that almost every patient had syncope or presyncope, severe headache, usually occipital neuralgia, visual changes. Uh, many of these patients reported uh, blackouts uh, uh, while, while being awake or tunnel vision. Uh, one woman said that since adolescence, she had to memorize everything in her room so she didn't walk into it. Uh, most patients reported walking into doorways or people and they attributed that to clumsiness. Uh, uh, most, almost all reported tinnitus, nausea, memory and concentration problems. On exam, they had tenderness over C12, hyperreflexia, decreased sensation of pinprick. Now, they could feel the pin and they knew it was pointy, but it, it caused no pain. Usually cervical, thoracic, lumbar and sacral dermatomes were hyposensitive to pinprick. Uh, half the patients had dystidocokinesia, a Romberg sign or weakness. Next. So uh, here's a typical fusion uh, uh, using the you know good allograft infused with bone marrow. Uh, we had a hundred percent fusion rate. Next. Uh, headaches uh, and neck pain were improved with a statistical significance of 0 0.003. Next. Uh, and occipital neuralgia. <clears throat> Most of the headaches were really uh, uh, occipital neuralgia. Next. Uh, this uh, busy slide, uh, so, uh, looking down the fourth line, we're surprised to find that muscle and joint pain uh, was uh, statistically uh, improved. Numbness in the hands was uh, highly uh, uh, significant. Uh, we saw improvement in weakness nausea, exercise intolerance, and even uh, behavioral symptoms like anxiety and depression were substantially improved. Palpitations, dizziness, brain fog, tremors were not statistically significant. Next. <coughs> On the uh, SF36, we saw improvement in vigorous activities, bending, kneeling, stooping, 
walking several hundred yards. Next. Uh, there's a statistical improvement in the Konofsky performance. Next. And most of those patients were returning to school or to help, you know, being, you know, taking care of children at home or back to work. 90% uh, of the patients would repeat the surgery. 10% said they would not do it again. 80% uh, reported improved quality of life, 20% not. When we asked them why, when they were asked by the nurse why they didn't report an improved quality of life, many of them said it was, it was because of the comorbid conditions like mast cell activation syndrome and postural orthostatic tachycardia and the multiple allergies, eating problems, and so on. Uh, and the global impression of change, uh, two-thirds reported a significant improvement, uh, one-third no significant improvement. Next. So complications, uh, I'll go back, please. Uh, there were no, uh, oh, actually, I'll go back one more. Yes. The uh, looking at syncope, presyncope, and lightheadedness together, which was really the main focus of the study, we saw a improvement with a p-value of 0 0.008, so that uh, for most of these patients, uh, the, these syncopal episodes were no longer uh, really uh, severe. Next. There were no uh, perioperative complications. Uh, we uh, found one broken screw uh, a year later in one patient. She, she did fuse, uh, but we ended up extending her fusion to include the cranium because she developed craniocervical instability. And there's one misplaced screw shown here, and you might see the screw entering the atlantocondylar space, and that caused the patient headaches, and uh, we needed to remove that screw. You see it was too medial on the lower left picture as well. Uh, the, uh, the fusion did, uh, uh, he did fuse though, next. So uh, these, these symptoms then uh, were, I, I feel, we feel accurately predicted atlantoaxial instability in the connective tissue disorder population. Headache, occipital neuralgia usually, syncope and presyncope, visual blurring, blackouts or tunnel vision, intermittent dysesthesias of the arms and hands, nausea, poor memory and concentration, and tinnitus. And I have to say, a lot of these symptoms, when I was in medical school, if you presented with these symptoms, they'd say that this was kind of an hysterical patient. You know, tunnel vision was thought to be a, a, a sign of hysteria, but it is a real phenomenon in these patients. Next. Uh, the study was limited by its retrospectivity, its non-randomized small cohort. There's no control for placebo. Uh, there may have been recall bias or an obsequious factor of resulting in tendency to give you know, good answers, although they were given to the nurse, not the doctor. And comorbid conditions profoundly impacted the majority of subjects uh, deleteriously uh, and influenced our outcome metrics. Next. Uh, so, uh, next, a few things to look out for. Uh, if there's a small diameter, uh, many of these connective tissue disorders have uh, some degree of spinal stenosis. And if the graft uh, goes too deeply, it can cause uh, cord compression or at least impact on the spinal canal space and, and obstruct uh, spinal fluid, uh, as Dr. Allen would be interested in. The uh, the posterior ring of C1 is often very small in these in this population, and 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 so uh, easily able to fail a bone graft unless you very carefully sculpt the graft and get very good contact with the C1 ring. Um, also, I, I mentioned uh, the C1 screw. You need to look at the condyle and aim, and and you have to miss the condyle. So aim for the lower third of the anterior tubercle of C1 as seen on lateral fluoroscopy to avoid that atlantocondylar space. Next. Next. Uh, we had a patient with a pro-atlantal type one and 
upper right, uh, lower right, there's a picture from the internet showing the uh, internal carotid feeding the uh, vertebral artery. Uh, the, so that's prolantal. Uh, Ponticulus posticus is a common thing. It occurs in up to 17% uh, of patients uh, in, in one series anyway. In our series of patients, uh, we didn't, I didn't tote up the numbers, but it was about 35% of patients had a ponticulus posticus where the nerve, where the artery and the vertebral nerve that runs with the artery are trapped by this uh, bony continuum. And that may give them an increased risk for headache and for uh, stroke. Next. Uh, we had, well, next, uh, one patient with venous uh, congestion. Uh, the uh, abnormal alignment in the upper spine can obstruct CSF flow. Next. Uh, so let me very briefly discuss patho, uh, pre, uh, discussion of pathophysiology next. So it, it's well understood that with uh, excessive rotation of C1 upon C2, that there's uh, stretching and, uh, and uh, kinking of the vertebral artery. This is shown by Menezes and Dvorak and uh, Punjabi. So after about 38 degrees rotation, you start seeing obstruction of the vertebral arteries. At 45 degrees, there's no flow through either vertebral artery. Next. And uh, uh, go ahead, next. Now with the fielding type one, uh, the C1 is rotating on C2 and the atlantodental interval is normal, but the spinal canal uh, diameter greatly decreases and this, this obstructs CSF flow, uh, going back to what Dr. Allen was discussing. And uh, it can also cause mechanical deformation of the lower brainstem and upper spinal cord next. Uh, back uh, and go back one, please. The uh, and notice here the uh, this is a, a rodent, but the uh, the sympathetic fibers lie just lateral to the pyramidal tracts. The double staining there, double labeled. And next, and I'll go back. And so we believe that you know the cord is tethered by the denticulate ligaments, and with the excessive rotation. There's a twisting and a mechanical deformative stress. Next. And we, we showed back in uh, 94 that uh, deformation of the brainstem caused these stretch injuries and these silver staining re uh, retraction balls, uh, also seen in brain injury, but definitely seen in brainstem and spinal cord. Next. And the same, uh, the same phenomenon, next, was seen uh, by public shock, uh, stretching axons caused clumping of the neurofilaments and microtubules and formation of these axon balls. This is seen on electron microscopy next. And Satman showed that uh, deformation and stretching of the mass optic nerve next caused these same uh, retraction balls in three days next. And uh, Wolf showed that stretching axons caused this a big infusion of calcium into the axon with its deleterious consequences next. Uh, and uh, Arendine showed that uh, stretching and strain uh, was an epigenetic stimulus so that there was upregulation of n methyl aspartate, which rendered the neurons more sensitive to uh, chemical and physical stresses. Next. And, and uh, Shai showed that Simply stretching a nerve caused a, uh, a degradation of compound action potential amplitudes. And if the stretching is applied rapidly, that degradation of amplitude occurs much more uh, profoundly. Next. So in conclusion, um, if there's a syndrome of, oh, go back, <laughs> syndrome of severe occipital headache, syncope or presyncope, vision changes, dysesthesias of the extremities should prompt consideration of atlantoaxial instability. And a diagnosis of rotary atlantoaxial instability, fielding type one, is difficult and requires dynamic imaging. 
the appropriate reduction and stabilization of C12 is associated with significant improvement of neurological symptoms and the syncope, presyncope, and lightheadedness has substantially improved with stabilization. Patient satisfaction is high. Next. Dysautonomia occurs, oh, this one at a time, occurs frequently with heredit hereditary connective tissue disorders. Next. Uh, it's strongly associated with conditions of instability and deformation of the brainstem and upper spinal cord. Next. It shows improvement after reduction in, of deformity and stabilization. Next. So I'd like to acknowledge my co-workers, Claire Francomano, Robert Rose, Melanie Narayanan, Miles Kobe, Peter Rowe, and Kelly Tuckman. And thank you for your attention.